The Simpsons is an animated television program that debuted in 1989. It was a spin-off from a series of shorts that first appeared on The Tracy Ullman Show in 1987. The show is about an American family comprised of parents Homer and Marge and their three children, Bart, Lisa and Maggie, and the various incidents that occur in their lives. Homer is an average 30-something male, whose lack of intelligence is often the source of the comedy. Marge is a nagging housewife. Bart is a rebellious 10-year-old. Lisa is the underappreciated brain of the family. Maggie is the baby. I was seriously considering doing this entire video as if you don't obviously know what The Simpsons is. Almost everyone around my age and slightly older or younger is nostalgic for The Simpsons in some capacity, which is weird given that it's never actually gone anywhere, and people younger than me are still nostalgic for it, even if they were born well into the period when the show's decline in quality was a common opinion. The golden age of The Simpsons has just been rerun so often, and now that it's found its way onto streaming services, those first seasons are still the ideal candidate as the first show that preteens watch that could be loosely called an adult show. And those early seasons are still something that everyone returns to every once in a while to engage in something easygoing and comforting. And the reason I'm making this video is I want to understand how the show achieved that effect on people in the first place, and also, when did the golden age end? Because almost everyone seems to have a different answer to that question. And also specifically, what is it that makes the Golden Age so materially different to what came after it? Given the show basically carried on doing what it always did, there must be a reason why this vague period of sometime between seasons 9 and 11 is where the common view that The Simpsons stopped being good started to form. If it is just Simpsons fatigue, and your average person just not needing to watch hundreds of episodes of the same characters doing basically the same things over and over again, then there must be a reason why I can still occasionally return to the Golden Age and have just as good a time watching it now as I used to, even though I've seen episodes like Marge vs. the Monorail and Bart the Murderer a thousand times by this point. And yet the idea of throwing on something random from seasons 18, 24 or 29 is anathema to me. What makes a Season 3 episode better than a Season 23 episode? Because I have stopped myself when I found myself agreeing with common complaints about the current state of The Simpsons and thought to myself, wait, wasn't that also true during the Golden Age? Is the Golden Age even a thing at all, or is it just this collective invention by fans? Another interesting question is, why is the show still generally speaking popular, even if lots of people don't actually watch what it's currently doing anymore? Because the widespread cultural permeation of The Simpsons never actually went anywhere. The Simpsons movie was still a huge deal, even though it was released well after the opinion that the show's gone downhill went mainstream. Even now, people are occasionally saying the show is good again and that we're undergoing a Simpsons renaissance, which usually fades away between seasons, and then suddenly about a year later, The Simpsons is once again doing the quote-unquote best season since the Golden Age. What even is The Simpsons now? I call myself a fan of it, but I haven't consistently watched it in years, and I'm not the only one. People call themselves fans of The Simpsons, even if they only actually like less than a third of it. So what I've decided to do is watch the entire thing. All of it. In order, as they came out. Analyse what I watch as I go along, and see if I can come up with some answers as to what the Golden Age actually is, and what, if anything, makes it so materially different to what came after it. Whether common accusations levelled at episodes that supposedly destroyed certain characters actually hold up to scrutiny, and whether the characters really changed and became caricatures of themselves like people have always said that they did. Inevitably, this will take me a very, very long time, and it will span multiple videos on the topic, which will appear on my channel in between other projects because if I had to do this whole thing all in one go, I would go completely insane. In this one we're going to cover the period typically known as the Golden Age, and next one is going to cover everything after it, leading up to and including the movie. And just to make things clear right off the bat, since The Simpsons is not a show that really does ongoing storylines, I'm going to be structuring these observations about the characters and stories in this era in a more general, non-linear order. And I won't really be going through it tooth comb chronological season by season fashion, outside of the opening discussion on the first season, for reasons that will become apparent in a moment. Season 1 of The Simpsons is a unique beast. It never typically gets included when people say The Simpsons Golden Age. Usually people say The Golden Age starts around Season 3, and I seem to be fairly alone in thinking that Season 1 is amazing. 
It's weird to call the first season of one of the most influential and acclaimed shows of all time underrated, but season one of The Simpsons might just be the most underrated thing I've ever watched. I see why people don't typically like it. While it contains all the same elements as any other season, tonally it is wildly different to what came afterwards. It doesn't just feel wrong to people because the animation style is noticeably more primitive, and Homer's voice is a bit more gravelly and it's less clownish than it ends up being. You're not going anywhere until you tell me what a quidgy bow is. The doctor thought I might have brain damage. Dad, what's the point of this story? I like stories. The main reason season one has ended up being so divisive is simply because it is miserable. In episode three, Homer tries to commit suicide. Lisa is completely depressed about the state of the world at the tender age of eight. The plot of episode two involves Bart losing all his friends. My mom once said something that really stuck with me. You're a big disappointment. And God bless her soul, she was really on to something. Season 1 feels so much more dangerous than anything The Simpsons did after it. Really, Season 1 of The Simpsons is like what the dark adult modern reboot of the show would be like if it was this long cancelled property that's been revived for modern generations by a studio that doesn't really understand its appeal. And yet, there's something about season one that speaks to me on a level that the show has never really matched since. This is not to say it's the best one, far from it, but as a singular self-contained 13 episode season about a dysfunctional lower middle class American family that's essentially wearing the skin of one of the most successful comedy vehicles of all time, season one is a fascinating watch now. One of the most common forms of Simpsons jokes are the fantasy sequences, where a harp will play and we'll see what a character's thinking either in a thought bubble or we'll enter an elaborate fantasy sequence that breaks the reality of the Simpsons universe. You all know the format of these jokes, these visions and daydreams are almost like mini treehouse of horrors, and in season one they're so much darker and more twisted than the later seasons. The Nelson sequences in Bart the General are particularly striking, where Nelson is presented as this unstoppable machine, impervious to bullets. You forget the intensity that these seemingly inconsequential childhood squabbles had when you grow up, and framing the Nelson-Bart standoff through these nightmare visions and homages to war films was a genius way of using the impressionism allowed by the cartoon format to tell a very real and ultimately human story. Thanks, Bart. We got the day off from school for this. Yeah, and I got the day off from work. Homer! But what's a day off from work when I'm never going to see my beloved son again? Jesus Christ, this season's dark. The most effective episode of season one, and easily one of the best that the show has ever put out, was Life on the Fast Lane. The one that you've all seen a thousand times, where Marge starts falling for her charismatic bowling instructor, Jacques. Jacques is a man with a seductive French accent who speaks with a bizarre passion for bowling. There's funny bits in Life on the Fast Lane, but watching it today, with the context of what The Simpsons ended up becoming, it didn't even feel like a comedy to me. It felt like this harrowing, serious drama about a mother of three being seduced by a man who fancies himself a bit of a lady killer. Oh, Jacques, I'm a married woman. I know, I know. My mind says stop, but my heart and my hips cry proceed. Of course, I do know that Homer and Marge don't break up and she doesn't sleep with Jacques because it's been drilled into my head over decades of being a Simpsons fan that Homer and Marge's marriage, while being a mess, is completely indestructible no matter what. But watching this now, it felt much more urgent. Seeing Bart and Lisa having genuine grief over the fact their parents' marriage is falling apart right before their eyes felt so utterly real and compelling in a way that I really haven't felt about The Simpsons since. While this episode is not so much funny, the speech that Homer gives to Marge at the end about sandwiches is completely heartbreaking. Everyone makes peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, but usually the jelly drips out over the side. But your jelly stays right in the middle where it's supposed to. I don't know how you do it. You just got a gift, I guess. I've always thought so. He takes this small domestic chore and turns it into this grand metaphor for the role that Marge plays in their lives, and it is powerful. That's the genius of season one. People can say that season one wasn't funny, and to an extent I will agree with them. It was much funnier than I remembered it being, and I'm sure that audiences at the time found it incredibly funny, but it's the context of the later seasons that's changed everyone's view of it, and that context makes watching it today feel like this refreshing alternative take on the show. Even if there are a couple of episodes that feel completely alien to you now. 
No Disgrace Like Home, while it is funny, is completely baffling if you grew up watching and re-watching everything that came after season 1. So Homer's taken the family to a work picnic and they all embarrass him. Marge gets drunk, Annie realises his family's a mess and he needs to take them to therapy to straighten them out. Coming from the context of later Simpsons, you spend the runtime thinking, wait, isn't taking on this role in the story supposed to be Marge's job? Why is Homer the one forcing them to sell the TV? In fact, they do this same basic story in future seasons, where Marge is embarrassed of Homer's drinking and the kids make fools of themselves in public in episodes like Scenes of a Class Struggle in Springfield and The Mysterious Voyage of Our Homer. Your family sees you as a rather stern authority figure. Really? Homer? But Marge, look at that hangdog expression. He's learned his lesson. Let's get him a present. That Homer? What mostly came fully formed though, aside from the odd episode that sits wrong now, was a sense of who all these characters were as people, so let's get on to that. An incredibly common opinion of Homer is that he's gotten dumber with every season, and I thought that too before I started this rewatch. It's an opinion that's so common that it's basically canon at this stage. But looking back, although season 1 is rawer and grittier, right from the very first episode, he has always been depicted as unintelligent and dangerously unsuited to working with radioactive materials. Here he is in Roasting on an Open Fire acting as if these obvious warning signs that something's going wrong with the equipment are no big deal. And he's always been childlike as well. This is from Bart the Genius, the second ever episode. He's frequently absent from school, then gives teachers pathetic excuse notes that are obviously childish forgeries when compared to... Thing is though, over the course of the early years, while Homer's stupidity is overplayed for comic effect, he's only really too comedically dumb when the joke requires him to be. Of course, someone who's been working in a dangerous field like nuclear power for about 10 years wouldn't be completely incompetent, otherwise everyone in the town would almost certainly have died by now. And he does seem to know what he's talking about when the episode requires him to. Inefficiently mining uranium that can be purchased quite cheaply on the foreign market. Uh, the long-term benefits more than offsetting the one-time cost. As I watched Homer in these early years, I started to think that his lack of intelligence is almost an impressionistic depiction of the way that Homer sees himself. Impressionistic fantasies are a big deal in early Simpsons, and while Homer is bullish and confident when he has a scheme, I think his vulnerable side is the key to understanding him. Let's take a look at Homer Defined from Season 3, where there's a core meltdown and he gets locked inside at his terminal. Homer Simpson, big, dumb, balding North American ape, is the key link to figuring out how to stop a nuclear disaster. Whatever problem this is, I'm sure they know how to handle it. Huh? Ah, it's my problem! We're doomed! And of course you, the viewer, thinks, oh yeah, that's Homer, isn't it? Incompetent. How's Homer, of all people, going to get out of this? But the reason I bring this up is to demonstrate that Homer thinks that about himself he immediately thinks about how incompetent he is. His first thought is remembering not paying attention when he's being taught what to do in a situation like this, and he envisions the dictionary showing him as the definition of stupid. And obviously, he's in a dangerous situation, he's freaking out, and stress can cause you to forget how to do the simplest of things, like remember which button to press. I know people are going to push back at me on this, but it kind of fits, because Homer has basically grown up with no sense of self-worth. With a parent as awful as Abe was, he would obviously internalise all the bad things that people have ever told him about himself. Homer was never stubborn. He always folded instantly over anything. It was as if he had no will of his own. Isn't that true, Homer? Yes, Dad. My theory is that Homer has imposter syndrome, and his view of the nuclear power plant, if taken not as an actual legitimate depiction of a nuclear power plant, because... C c come on, it's way more complicated than they make it seem. This is how he views the place as a result of the bad job that deep down he feels that he's been doing. Not necessarily has been doing. There comes a point where if he is this bad, it's not really his fault anymore. If he is as bad as he seems, it's Mr Burns' fault. This idea makes total sense of the Season 1 episode that people generally love but looks weird in hindsight, Homer's Odyssey. So Homer gets fired from the nuclear plant after causing an accident where he's trying to impress Bart when he visits on a school trip. 
Now that Homer's been taken out of the context of the nuclear power plant, where the dull, mind-numbing work and his inadequacy isn't constantly on his mind, he starts local action for safety, and he sounds really passionate about it. And he ends up at a place where he realises his campaign for safety ends with the most dangerous thing in Springfield, his former workplace. Now that he's outside of a system that's kept a boot to his throat for so long, Homer is driven, dedicated to his interests, and he looks like he can thrive. Mm. You're not as stupid as you look, or sound, or our best testing indicates. And then Homer ends up being recruited as the safety inspector, and it's treated as if this is Homer turning over a new leaf. He's found his passion, proven how capable he is, and things are going to change. Except nothing changed. Because if the change, then that breaks the comedic formula. And so Homer goes back to being the lazy, incompetent slob that we know and love. Because stick him back in the context of a dangerous, yet thoroughly mind-numbing job that exists to destroy his sense of self-worth, with a boss as vicious as Monty Burns, and it looks like he's completely incapable. Even though we know that he isn't. Because we've had evidence of it shown to us. He wasn't incompetent in Homer's Odyssey when he was organising, and he's actually not incapable in quite a lot of episodes where he shows off his enterprising skills. Look at Homer vs. the 18th Amendment. He successfully ran a bootlegging operation. In fact, Marge compliments him for it. Homer, that's very clever. Eh? Mom? Well, it is. I've known your father since high school, and this is the cleverest thing he's ever done. Homer does have intelligence when it comes to fields in which he's genuinely enthusiastic. It's the environment of the power plant that keeps him beaten down. The special demotivational plaque to break what's left of your spirit. Don't forget, you're here forever. If you look at Homer this way, he starts to make a lot more sense. The cartoon format is a lens that exaggerates these characters, and if you look at Homer as the impression of incompetence rather than actual incompetence, then he can act as stupid as the writer wants him to which the writers throughout the Golden Age took great advantage of. There's a great round table available on YouTube where Conan O'Brien and a bunch of writers from The Simpsons back in those early days talk about writing for the show during this period. I'm going to be referring to it a lot throughout this video, and they address how much fun they had over playing Homer's stupidity. To the point where I remember there was one episode where he, his brain tells him, if you do this stupid thing, I'm leaving you. And then <laughs> His consciousness left him, and I thought, I don't think we can go any further. Like, it's the, that's the blue-black at the edge of the atmosphere. Don't say revenge. Don't say revenge. Uh, revenge? That's it. I'm getting out of here. I'm gonna remind you, this is during the Golden Age. They have always made Homer unrealistically stupid. Just poke blindly at the controls until they let you go. Still not sure how he caused the meltdown. There wasn't any nuclear material in the truck! Well, yeah, he couldn't have realistically done that, could he? That's the joke. The episode people are probably going to point to as a counter-argument for this is Homer's enemy. But I can wave that away too with the excuse that this episode is told from the perspective of Frank Grimes, an overachieving busybody who had to work way harder at life to get a tenth as far as Homer did, and will obviously view Homer with jealousy and disdain. And, you know, he's also kind of an audience surrogate who's watching Homer's stupidity and incompetence for years, and is a meta-commentary on this comedic formula. Who knows, maybe when I watch the later seasons again, maybe it'll start bugging me. But Homer's stupidity becoming too exaggerated over time is starting to make less sense to me now that I've seen him do things like this way back in Season 2. My name is Mr. Burns. I believe you have a letter for me. Okay, Mr. Burns. Uh, what's your first name? I don't know. Or this in Season 3. Sheltering myself with a large piece of sheet metal, I ran for cover under the tallest tree I could find. Just the idea that Homer's been getting dumber every year has been a point of criticism for about as long as the show has existed. They even point this out in a clip show from Season 7. Professor Lawrence Pierce of the University of Chicago writes, I think Homer gets stupider every year. That's not a question, Professor. The difference I'm probably going to end up finding between this and the later seasons, though, is the overtness of his vulnerability. The best Homer episodes I watched during this period were One Fish, Two Fish, Blowfish, Bluefish, and Homer's Triple Bypass, both of which threaten us with Homer's potential death. The characters all treat Homer's apparent poisoning by Blowfish and his constant heart attacks with the utmost severity. 
but Home is just such a naturally funny character that that offsets just how utterly bleak the situation is. No need, Doc. I can read Marge like a book. <gasps> Ooh, it's good news, isn't it? At the same time, though, the genuinely heartfelt moments between Homer, Marge, Lisa, and Bart in these circumstances where he genuinely could die are the things that make these episodes stick with you. These episodes are not just funny. And Lisa? I guess this is the time to tell you. You're adopted and I don't like you. Bart! I think I love these episodes so much because while Homer can be unrealistically dumb in both of them, the sense of just how fiercely he cares about his family is what carries his character through thick and thin. Goodbye, Lisa. I know you'll make me proud. Goodbye, Bart. I like your sheets. Bart Simpson was always sold to people as Dennis the Menace of the 90s. He skateboards, carries a slingshot, and spends his every waking moment causing mayhem. But a slightly more extreme form of mayhem than Dennis the Menace. Although this mayhem has been devalued as adult cartoons have gotten more and more extreme. As noted by South Park, in the lineage between Dennis the Menace and Eric Cartman, Bart is very much in the middle. Given the internet's predilection towards armchair psychology, which in all fairness I'm probably a bit guilty of myself, it's often been theorised that Bart is either a psychopath or a sociopath. I am not a psychologist, so I don't feel comfortable using either label. I will point out here though that it's not that Bart doesn't know right from wrong, as he clearly does. It's just that he genuinely can't help himself. Some of the most interesting moments for Bart are when he's put in a situation where an opportunity to cause trouble is presented to him, with his potential victim exaggerating how obvious the opportunity is as part of the joke. And you can see him fighting the urge to do it because he knows it would either upset Lisa, as in Duffless, or a girl he has a crush on in Bart's girlfriend. <laughs> While you kids are looking at that, I'll just busy myself in this file cabinet. Must fight Satan. If Bart were a total psychopath, then Sweet Seymour Skinner's badass song, which is probably his best focal episode, wouldn't work at all. Bart's idea to bring Santa's little helper to school with him as a result of him not thinking about a school assignment until the morning of ends up getting Principal Skinner fired. Did you just call me a liar? No, I said you were fired. Oh. That's much worse. Although they've been at loggerheads for the entire series, Bart feels genuinely bad for Skinner, and they strike up a friendship outside of school. These aren't the actions of a complete Hellraiser who genuinely doesn't give a shit who he hurts. I think you need Skinner, Bart. Everybody needs a nemesis. Sherlock Holmes had his Dr. Moriarty. Mountain Dew has its mellow yellow. Even Maggie has that baby with the one eyebrow. Alright, yes, this analysis that Lisa offers where Bart realises he needs to get Skinner his job back makes it self-serving to some degree, but he does showcase genuine regret over the course of this episode. And this is a common feature with Bart when he gets in trouble. This is the difference between an Eric Cartman and a Bart Simpson for me. I don't actually want to see Bart get what's coming to him most of the time, because although he does bad things, you can always see the root of it. He is only 10 years old and he's learning his callous behaviour from an environment that either won't allow him to thrive in ways that would be beneficial for him, as is the case with the school, or is actively teaching him bad lessons, as is the case with Homer. Now I've gotten word that a child is using his imagination, and I've come to put a stop to it. If something's hard to do, then it's not worth doing. It is mostly Bart's environment that's causing him to act the way he does that's exaggerated for comic effect. And you see evidence of this when they stop him and Skinner from butting heads for an episode. Or in, say, Whacking Day, where, like in Homer's Odyssey, he's removed from the environment that pretty much exists to ensure he fails. This is the end. You are expelled from Springfield Elementary. And as a result, he finds he actually enjoys learning. Whacking Day starts with Bart being treated as guilty before he's even done anything wrong. Skinner has designed a trap not for troublemakers, but potential troublemakers, as a way of ensuring the inspection goes as smoothly as possible. You're being swept under the rug for the superintendent's visit. Enjoy! Sure, they all have form, and it turns out he was right to do this, of course, as Bart breaks out of the basement that Skinner locks them in, and finds himself drawn to cause the trouble that gets him expelled. 
But Skinner's idea to lock these kids up in the basement doesn't exactly make him the hero in this situation. If you treat people a certain way, they will probably start conforming to your perception of them. And Bart does try and stop himself from causing trouble. This sinister impulse inside of him speaks to him through fantasy, goading him on. Come on, Bart. Ride me. I better not. <laughs> then when he gets expelled, outside of the school, he learns and uncovers the truth about Whacking Day. And this is tied into episodes focused on Lisa and Bart trying to find some justice for people in Springfield who've been screwed over. Bart demonstrates his sense of justice for the underdog in cases like The Day the Violence Died, where he doesn't think for a second to ask Chester J. Lampwick what would happen if he gets him the rights to Itchy and Scratchy back. Bart just knows that it's unfair that Chester came up with this idea for this multi-billion dollar franchise and hasn't seen a cent of the profits and is now homeless and living in a gutter. I hope you're happy, kid. The studio's bankrupt. You just killed Itchy and Scratchy. Bart is fundamentally a good person being failed by the adults in his life who don't know how to direct him towards a life that he would thrive in. This gets underscored in Lisa Sachs, a flashback episode where we see just how excited Bart was for his first day at school. School will be fun! And then immediately he's broken by the experience and he learns that the only way he gets respect out of anyone is by acting out. I want you to knock off that potty dog right now. The principal said potty! <laughs> <laughs> None of this is to excuse Bart's behaviour, of course. It was incredibly cruel to watch him essentially catfishing Mrs. Krabappel with seductive letters in Bart the Lover. Not to mention creepy as all hell. But look at the end here where he realises the harm he caused, and then he comes clean after getting his cheap laugh. Throughout the show, Bart is caught in this constant battle between his good instincts and the bad environment that's constantly leading him to do the things that he does. It wasn't Bart's idea to steal the head of the Jebediah Springfield statue, that was a clear combination of peer pressure and bad advice from Homer, and the head itself becomes a manifestation of his conscience. You don't have to found a town to be a hero. Sometimes a hero can be a young boy with the courage to stand up and admit he's made a mistake. Although the events of the second half of Bart the Murderer get triggered by Bart organising some graffiti and attempting to bribe his way out of it, it was Fat Tony that says, I think we should pay Skinner a little visit, and then Bart is terrified that they murdered him, and that essentially makes him responsible for Skinner's death. When... He he's ten, guys. He's a ten-year-old boy. Bart's environment is skewed in such a way that it's always entirely and exclusively his fault whatever happens, including in Bart the Murderer, in which an entire courtroom is supposed to reasonably believe that a ten-year-old child is responsible for organised crime, which even Homer agrees with. Oh, it's true, it's true, all the pieces fit! <laughs> so obviously being a product of his environment, it only stands to reason that in episodes like Bart vs Thanksgiving, when there's a case of something incredibly simple like Bart broke his sister's centerpiece, he is psychologically incapable of apologising because, oh, yep, it's just another thing that I'm responsible for, because this is Springfield, where we always look for really simple cause and effect solutions that always ignore the fact that the reasons why bad things happen are often more complex than a simple, the boy is bad. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm so and if the boy is bad, Bart can never learn any deeper lessons from anything that happens, and so he's destined to keep making the same mistakes over and over again. If he is just bad, then he can't change, so what's the point in trying? No one is there to explain to Bart why something is his fault and what he can do to remedy it. Except for, of course, Lisa. The only reason to apologise is if you look deep down inside yourself and you find a spot. Because you feel bad, you hurt your sister's feelings. This is so stupid. I'm not going to find anything. Just because I wrecked something she worked really hard on and I made her cr- Uh-oh. I'm sorry, Lisa. You know, Marge, we're great parents. D I just, just... No, you're not. Your eight-year-old child had to do all the legwork there to teach her own brother about empathy and just... Just... Oh, God. 
And anyway, speaking of Lisa, let's get on to her. I know some of you will have been listening to me ramble about Bart's faults being the product of a comically exaggerated bad environment and been thinking, wait, what about Lisa? Well, I don't have much of an explanation for why Lisa is so wonderful, amazing and perfect and perceptive and insightful. But I would like to point out here that it's always been said that Homer is unrealistically stupid. But has anyone ever complained about the fact Lisa is unrealistically intelligent for an 8 year old? Like, have you ever met an 8 year old child that sounds like this? But aren't the police a protective force that maintains the status quo for the wealthy elites? Don't you think we ought to attack the roots of social problems instead of jamming people into overcrowded prisons? Real life eight year olds are much more like Lisa's classmates. I mean, the things she says are sexist. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa said a dirty word! <laughs> it's actually incredibly rare to see Lisa acting and sounding like a legitimate child, and so it's quite weird when you see her giggling or skipping or jumping up and down and talking about ponies. Part of me thinks maybe the writers approach her as if they're writing for a teenager instead of an eight-year-old. So Lisa kind of exists to be the one reasonable, rational member of the family. She's essentially the voice of God. She's there to diffuse tensions, explain things, and make perceptive remarks that set characters on the right paths. She's the moral compass of the show, and that's probably what makes her my favourite Simpson to just listen to. This is not to say Lisa's not flawed and vulnerable, of course. When a character is this preternaturally smart, especially relative to our own family, it'll isolate her. And when you're isolated, your weak points can easily be exploited. As is the case with one of my favourite Lisa subplots in Brother from the Same Planet, where she gets addicted to a predatory phone hotline featuring some celebrity boy charging $4.95 a minute to pretend like he's your boyfriend. Here are some words that rhyme with Corey. Glory. Story. Allegory. Montessori. Like with Bart and Homer, plots like this where she's vulnerable are key to making Lisa three-dimensional. You don't just like Lisa because she's smart and perceptive, you gotta synthesize this sense of empathy for her by showing how existing as this preternaturally smart voice of reason affects her as a human being. Moaning Lisa gets this insanely right and is another reason why I will simp for season one until the day I die. This opening scene is still completely jaw-dropping three and a half decades later, and it conveys so much about this lonely little girl without even saying a single line of dialogue. Golden Age Simpsons really gets mental health insanely right, and if you want to write anything mental health related, this is where you start. Lisa's depression stops her from saying the things that bug her out loud, like Marge giving her last cupcake away, because the depression is just saying, what's the point, I can't change anything, so why even try? Moaning Lisa also pushes back against popular myths about how to logic someone out of depression. This exchange here is the perfect demonstration of how to portray depression. You know you play pretty well for someone with no real problems. Yeah, but I don't feel any better. Bleeding Gums Murphy clearly doesn't suffer from depression. He's quite upbeat in spite of his problems, and he finds it strange that Lisa feels depression even though she doesn't have a whole lot to worry about, so she makes no sense to him. Speaking as someone who suffered from his fair share of depression, I have heard this said a lot about how, why are you complaining? Your life is great compared to other people. That's not how it works. Depression's not about the specific things that bother you being good or bad relative to anyone else, and just telling you that doesn't make you feel better. Unless you're actually a licensed therapist, all you can really do for someone suffering with depression is exactly what Marge does at the end of this episode, where she makes it clear to Lisa that she doesn't expect anything from her. You wanna be sad, honey? Be sad! We'll write it out with you, and when you get finished feeling sad, we'll still be there. This moment is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen on television. It shows Marge breaking the cycle of how people who suffer like Lisa does are expected to behave. Marge uses her own feelings as a reference point in her empathy. She remembers feeling sad on her first day of school, but is then told by her mother that her involuntary feelings are a reflection of someone that she loves. Before you go out that door, let's put our happy face on, because people know how good a mommy you have by the size of your smile. Saying stuff like that reinforces the idea to kids that if you have a feeling that's counterintuitive to the feelings of people that you love, that's you doing something wrong, and so you self-punish. 
Marge stops that impulse when she gets it, and she learns how to deal with Lisa when she's in this place, and as a result, things improve. Another significant exploration of Lisa's tangled web of emotions is in separate vocations. After being told that she can't follow the career she wants, Lisa spirals into an attitude of, okay, to hell with all of you then. Although Lisa, being smart, when told that her fingers are too stubby to play the blues, she would probably be aware of the fact that there's a ton of geniuses who didn't let something like stubby fingers get in the way of their dreams. But Lisa also respects the adults around her, and takes on their cynicism uncritically. Even though she's smart, she has these emotional pressure points like anyone else. The structure of the show usually requires her to be the voice of reason, but these pressure points are there so that we believe her as a character, in spite of the fact that we know no eight-year-old sounds like this. And that's why she spends a lot of the show being this lovable underdog. She has these ideological positions that no one around her understands, and it's her environment's reaction to her deeply held beliefs that are more funny than Lisa is herself, because if she was just ideological, then she would become stuffy, boring and preachy. It's the reactions she gets where Marge makes a blank face, or an adult is genuinely caught off guard by this eight-year-old being more incisive than anyone has any right to be. And we can't watch Fox because they own those chemical weapon plants in Syria. And being the most ideological, she's one of very few Simpsons characters who's ever been allowed to change and have that change stick. Things had appeared to change in The Simpsons before Lisa the Vegetarian. Homer made friends with Ned in When Flanders Failed, and that episode ends with them both getting along. But Homer's back to hating Ned again not long after that. Typically stuff doesn't change and stay changed, because if it did, then that would break the comedic formula. But when Lisa goes vegetarian, it's not a comedic formula that's been challenged, and so the change is permitted. Lisa's personal journey in Lisa the Vegetarian was such a strong exercise in Lisa's self-discovery that this change just had to stick. She's thrown by the fact that no one around her can see her point of view, and this isn't like other instances where we can just have an easy resolution to finish the episode. You're not going to end meat consumption by one of your main characters going vegetarian, and so Lisa has to learn to live with what she sees in this episode. The smartest and most insightful Simpson still has to learn that while you can hold dearly to your beliefs, you've got to learn to coexist alongside others who don't see your point of view, including members of your own family. Granted, this lesson itself doesn't totally stick. It was only two years later that we're teaching Lisa this exact same lesson again in Lisa the Skeptic, where much to her surprise, even her mother believes that the angel skeleton they found is a real angel. But you have to admit, when that angel started to talk, you were squeezing my hand pretty hard. <laughs> Thanks for squeezing back. Anytime, my angel. As always, familial bonds trumps everything in The Simpsons. It is the soft spot of all the characters. I guess the lesson of Lisa Simpson is that intelligence isn't always everything, and it can hold you back in different ways that Bart's lack of intelligence holds him back. And speaking of being held back, let's look at the Simpson that we know the least about. No one really thinks about Maggie that much. It becomes a running gag that Homer forgets they even have a third child, which in my opinion is a rare example of a meta joke degrading the quality of the format. We always have one good kid and one lousy kid. Why can't both our kids be good? We have three kids, Homer. A dog doesn't count as a kid? No, Maggie! Oh yeah. Homer's supposed to be a very earnest character when it comes to his feelings for his kids, but his constant forgetting about his other daughter is entirely because the audience does, and it's a nod to us more than something his character would genuinely do. This joke started life of course because, you know, Maggie can't really say or do much, and is perpetually supposed to have been given birth to about a year ago, and the amount of things you can feasibly do with a character who can't speak and can only barely interact with the world around her is limited, and so the audience forgets about her, and so Homer does as well. She gets one focal episode in season 6 that tries, and in my opinion succeeds, in writing this wrong that was done to Homer through these jokes. Well, Maggie Makes 3 isn't so much a focal episode as Maggie hasn't been born yet for most of it, but she exists as an inevitable vague concept that Homer is vehemently against for most of it because her arrival essentially ruins his plans to follow his lower paid dream job. Kids shouldn't be made to feel like burdens, and this episode's great life lesson moment is where following Homer's dread over having to go beg for his job back, it leads to another of those beautiful moments. 
Like I said earlier with Life on the Fast Lane, The Simpsons' success is rooted in these small but incredibly powerful emotional moments. Aside from this episode, there are a handful of stories where Maggie stands out. There's Homer alone, where Marge and the kids are away, and Homer has to take care of Maggie on his own. He does an adequate job, but Maggie still misses Marge, and so she escapes her crib and goes out looking for her. We use the perspective of a baby and similarly shaped objects to Marge's hair for her to follow. It's not much, but it's cute. She's got a simple need that gets teased to her in comically unrealistic scenarios over the course of the episode. The other one that you all remember is the one from A Streetcar Named Marge, where Maggie is put in an Ayn Rand inspired daycare centre. Pacifiers are forbidden and get locked up, and Maggie has to lead a band of babies to break their pacifiers out, which she succeeds in doing. It's a really simple piece, and like with Lisa, it's unthinkable that Maggie can showcase such ingenuity at just one year old, but I see people reference this in Simpsons meme pages that I follow all the time. Quite remarkable for a B story that's not really got anything to do with the main plot. Maybe audiences at the time didn't respond to it like we do nowadays? Maybe they just struggled to come up with stories that could be mostly told silent? I don't know why they didn't do more subplots like this and actually indulge in the most underused Simpson. Because there is a character in there. Like Lisa, Maggie's clearly gifted. Like Bart, she's sensitive to injustice and ready to right a wrong. She's good at organising. They could do more stuff with her. It just started to feel after a while that it became a tradition not to do much with Maggie, rather than there being a legitimate reason for her continued underuse. Maybe she could start saying more than the occasional word every few years? I mean, it might feel a bit weird, given she's been mostly mute the entire time, and it might end up feeling a bit more like Rugrats than The Simpsons. The occasions where she has spoken have been really popular with fans, but they have been few and far between. I hope you never say a word. Daddy. And yes, that's nice and sentimental, but this isn't even Maggie's first word in the series. Her first word was technically in Flaming Moe's a year earlier. Albeit as part of Homer's deranged revenge fantasy. Mo. And yes, it is kind of funny that even when we do flash forwards, as in Lisa's wedding, there's conveniently always a reason why Maggie never gets to say a line in the episode. I need to use the phone! Will that girl ever shut up? Of course, this does make it so it stands out a lot when Maggie speaks particularly in Home Sweet Home Diddly Dum Doodly, where the kids have been fostered by the Flanders, and Maggie's starting to adjust to life with Ned, and says either her second and third, or third and fourth words, depending on your point of view. Doodly Doodly. But I do wish we saw more from Maggie's perspective during this period. The ending of this episode where we show her perspective of Homer, Bart and Lisa versus Marge was just gorgeous. What we've got isn't much, but coming out of the Golden Age, I ended up wanting to know more about Maggie Simpson. She seems cool. Now, in this five and a half hour video essay, I'm going to explore how Maggie Simpson is the perfect critique of capitalism. Now, Marx once wrote that the wealth of those societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails presents... Marge is probably the most realistic member of the family. She's also just as funny as all the others, but her humour is much more understated and stylistically very different to the physical humour and over-the-top stupidity of Homer. I think that's what I like so much about Marge. You have to be really paying attention to her to get the most out of her, and when you do, it's like finding buried treasure. Like with all the characters, her jokes are tightly knitted to the core of who she is as a person and couldn't have been told by anyone else. Look at all those beautiful shoes! Mm, if only I didn't already have a pair of shoes. We always think the core of who Marge is is the nagging housewife, and that is kind of true. 
She acts as the cipher by which the show can comment on things like overly concerned parents groups protesting the sort of things their kids are interested in. But to me what works so well about Marge is just how staggeringly little she expects out of life. And this sense is innate in her, and it's completely adorable. I'm for equal rights, but do we really need a whole amendment? Or double ply windows? They look just like regular windows, but they'll save us 4% on our heating bill. This is not to say she doesn't have needs, of course, and the fact she is so low maintenance and people in her life are completely incapable of meeting her incredibly simple needs is often the source of the comedy. Marge has to be really pushed quite violently to get to a point where her story can start. I'm going to go back to life on the fast lane again because it's such a perfect demonstration of Marge's character. It's not just that Homer disappoints her in this episode by forgetting to get her a birthday present and then rushing out to get one at last minute. Patty and Selma also contradict Marge when she says what restaurant she wants to go to. Marge, he never gets you anything you want. He always gets something for himself. Or the rusty barnacle is nice. No, no, no. We want to take you someplace fun. The singing sirloin. Mm -hmm. That noise she makes all the time, that hmm, is her suppressing the need to say what she wants out loud. Even on her birthday, none of this day is actually about Marge. It's what other people want for her, and she can't say what she wants out loud until she's pushed too far. And this ends up becoming a potentially fatal flaw to her marriage when Jacques starts pushing her into having an affair with him. Marge, darling, I, I want to see you tomorrow. Meet me tomorrow for brunch. This is probably why I love Life on the Fast Lane so much. It's such a dangerous story, and it uses Marge's introverted nature against her. She has to really fight against that instinct she has to not say what she's thinking out loud because her life is entirely defined by meeting other people's expectations, including Jacques. Even though she might find him exciting at first, he does the same thing everyone else does, pushes her into doing what he wants. Marge's introversion is why it's so powerful when Marge finally snaps or speaks out. When she gets pushed to breaking point, they give her this lion's roar. Look, lady, this better be good. I mean, sure, someone as introverted as Marge, you would think, wouldn't start, say, the movement to get Itchy and Scratchy shut down. But Itchy and Scratchy and Marge is an interesting episode because it's a demonstration of how you just should not fuck with introverts. Marge's initial letter to Itchy and Scratchy, while basically saying, Dear Mr. Successful Business Person, please cease the operations that have provided you with millions and millions of dollars, and is naive as all hell, it was at least polite. Please try to tone down the psychotic violence in your otherwise fine programming. Yours truly, Marge Simpson. Introverts hold their feelings back when dealing with people, but when you push them too far, that's when those feelings come out, and as a result, they can end up more extreme than they would be otherwise. Roger Myers didn't have to call Marge a screwball and rub it in her face that one person can't make a difference. He could have just brushed her off, but instead he went for the jugular, and that pushes Marge into reacting. So let me close by saying... And the horse I rode in on! I'll show them what one screwball can do! I also think it's really funny that although Itchy and Scratchy and Marge's central thesis is that people who complain about cartoons, like Marge does, are self-important busybodies who often have specific areas of hypocrisy where they won't push back if they're not personally offended, this episode is much more even-handed than you'd think. Because the central driver for the story is actually saying, yes, cartoons do influence children, and yes, that can be a problem. So television's responsible! Lemonade? Please, I made it just for you. Oh, I think it conveys a very nice message of sharing. I think it sucks. <laughs> Marge doesn't actually want much. She just wants a nice life, her family to be safe and well-adjusted, and to be appreciated every once in a while. And if she ends up nagging, it's because those incredibly basic needs haven't been met. I mean, yes, she is a nagger, but that's the thing about nagging. Typically, people don't listen to it. And there are occasions where Marge questions herself about that. She is aware of her reputation as a nagger, and she doesn't want to do it. Maybe if I use my least nagging tone of voice. Homer. Homer? Homer? That's it, that's the one. All right, send the money in. As much as Marge might want what's best for her kids and is a better parent than Homer, she also has her lapses in judgment. She has faults in her approach, and is part of this bad environment that's never been able to get to the root of Bart's problems. 
Like Principal Skinner, she has got to a point where she expects Bart to be bad. Bart, no! What? Sorry, force of habit. Lisa, no! But the fact the show plays heavily into both her sincerity and how overworked she is by a messy, slobby family means it's easier to forgive Marge for her lapses in judgement than it is for Homer. Although it was incredibly mean of her to say that Bart ruined Thanksgiving and is part of what causes him to run away from home, that episode actually shows us why Marge reacts this way earlier in the runtime. I have laryngitis and it hurts to talk. So I'll just say one thing. You never do anything right. The show is very sympathetic towards Marge, and like with Bart, you just naturally find yourself forgiving her for her lapses, because they're almost always the result of her being expected to be this linchpin that holds the family together. Even if she's not as smart as Lisa, she's the adult, she's more responsible than Homer, and is made to bear the brunt of everyone else's problems, which leads her into situations like Marge in Chains. She genuinely didn't mean to shoplift, and the legal system and Apu end up having an extreme overreaction to this very basic situation that in no way would play out like this in real life. <gasps> Mr. Simpson, you did not pay for this bottle of Colonel Quickie Mart's Kentucky Bourbon. Now you kids be good while mother's in prison. Hell in home sweet home diddly dum doodly, after one specific bad day where after being an absolutely perfect mother all morning, Marge lets herself have one nice thing and says fine, I'll blow off chores just this once and go to a spa with Homer, and that ends with her getting her kids taken off her. Which is just beyond ridiculous. If you've ever tried to get state services to do anything at all in your country, that fact alone will just make you piss yourself laughing and just go, just... Sure, Simpsons, that's how life works. But the overreaction of her environment is important in engendering our sympathy for Marge. We see just how overworked she is, and just how incredibly minor her infractions are. At least when compared with Homer. At a certain point, it becomes obvious a relationship doesn't work and is bad for both parties involved. Homer and Marge had a lot of huge fights over the course of the Golden Age, and Homer was kicked out more than once. First time being in Homer's Night Out, which is shockingly chaste by today's standards, but in 1990 reads like Homer committed this egregious marriage-destroying act by dancing with a scantily clad woman at a bachelor's party. From that point, Homer pissing Marge off seemingly to breaking point becomes a common tradition. Homer starts this pattern of repeatedly crossing the line and never learning from his mistakes. This is all comedically overplayed, of course, but a part of you does always wonder why she stays with him. Look at cases like this in the couples therapy that they go on in War of the Simpsons. He forgets birthdays, anniversaries, holidays, both religious and secular. He chews with his mouth open. He gambles. He drinks out of the carton. He never changes the baby. I guess that's it. Oh, wait, he kicks me in his sleep and his toenails are too long and yellow. That's all I can think of right now. You do end up wondering some of the time after their really big fights when it looks like Homer's genuinely about to change because the episode needs a resolution. Wait, things never changed after this. Homer continues being a sloppy mess who isn't good enough for her. Because The Simpsons relies on an elastic reality where things have to stay the same to some degree for the comedic formulas to continue working. Homer can't learn a lesson and have that lesson stick, because the show then changes from being a show about a dysfunctional family to a show about a functional family. And the reason you don't see shows about functional families is... Well, what would happen in them? Two parents love each other and their children, and that's it. The end. But if this was a real relationship, you would be telling Marge to just up and leave him. So to make the continued existence of Marge and Homer's relationship function with a reasonable suspension of disbelief that Marge would ever stay married to a man that does things like reveal their deepest secrets to the whole of the town in secrets of a successful marriage just because he wants to feel impressive to his night school class, you need to have some of the most convincing, heartfelt and downright captivating moments of pure untempered emotion ever written. And fortunately, they were so good at that it hurts. The strongest moment in all of the flashback episodes bar none is Homer's proposal in I Married Marge. Homer is searching in the back seat for the card that he was going to read, waggling his ass out at the front, while Marge finds the card containing his proposal. 
stupid thing must have fallen out of my pocket. Is this it? What's it say? I don't have much to offer you except all my love. Will you marry me, Homer? This is the most beautiful moment of my life. Proposals in TV shows are always supposed to be these big spectacle pieces where the guy does something impressive, the woman's overcome with emotion, everyone cries, the audience ahs, and it feels so magical. But the fact that Homer's proposal is so small and unimpressive, that's what makes this moment so powerful to me. Because I'm the sort of person that appreciates small things too. The best moments in my relationship haven't been the big gestures and moments that everyone expects a relationship to consist of. Sometimes the best moments to me are just when we're sat on the sofa under a cover watching TV with a pizza and our feet touch on the footstool. Moments of quiet, understated intimacy like that are more important to me. They stick out in my memory when I think of the good times. I hate it when TV shows indulge in the idea that love has to be perfect and impressive and beautiful all of the time because it's not real to me, and it feels like it's being done more for my benefit as a viewer and not for these characters as people. Being a man, obviously I hold true to the stereotype that men don't like romantic movies and shows, but watching Homer and Marge in this episode, I feel like I actually do. I just don't like the way it's done in almost every other movie or show that treats the central couple's romance as the most special and perfect and important thing in the world that I should be deeply impressed by. Relationships to me are private, personal things with intimate moments shared between partners that are only meant for them and them alone. And The Simpsons somehow manages to make it so a TV couple showing their relationship in the most public way possible to millions of people in a primetime slot can consist of these small, private, imperfect, intimate moments that are only supposed to exist for the sake of these two characters. I don't feel like an onlooker when I watch I Married Marge. I don't feel like I'm having a relationship shown off to me. Its imperfection is what makes it so I become one with Marge and Homer in that moment, and I want them to enjoy each other's company and grow old together. No other romantic moments anyone wants to quote me from any other TV show or movie even comes close to this scene for me. Imperfection is what makes the Homer and Marge marriage work so well. Yes, he's a slob. Yes, he's shitty to her and the kids. And Patty and Selma are right that he's not good enough for her. But like Bart, the sincerity of it is what makes me like it in spite of all of Homer's missteps and just how horrible he can be. And so I do buy that the marriage is completely indestructible and I do want them to stay together. If this was any other TV relationship, I would be screaming at the screen, come on, just leave him already. But I look at moments like this and I just can't do it. And they became a vital component for the show when it reached its new state beyond these initial couple of years. Some fans claim the show really found its feet in seasons 3 and 4, but I would like to see everyone basically extend that to season 2 because I really didn't notice a whole lot of jump in quality or change in style from 2 to 3. Nowhere near as much as I did from seasons 3 to 4. The way people talk about The Simpsons, it's as if it was this show that took a few years to find its feet, but in reality it was an overnight sensation. The season 2 premiere got the highest ratings for a broadcast episode. Part of the perception of 3 being the start of the golden age is probably because of the season 3 premiere, Stark Raving Dad, where the absolute biggest pop star on the planet at the time did a guest appearance, and that was held up as this moment where The Simpsons proved how culturally important it was. And that episode has now been removed from streaming. There is a noticeable progression in the style of the show, but it wasn't between seasons 2 and 3, it was between 3 and 4. We all typically see the golden years as just this blob of good Simpsons as opposed to bad Simpsons, but compare, say, Lisa's substitute with Marge vs. the Monorail from two years later, and there is a distinct difference in texture to the show. The more heartfelt moments become less important than straight-up gags. There's still heartfelt episodes like I Love Lisa, where Ralph falls in love with Lisa and gets his heart broken, but that's less memorable than I Call the Big One Bitey. Moments like You Are Lisa Simpson are much less noticeable than what are now the big memes. The big memes are important, of course, I'm not going to deny that, and season 4 is the point where the show transitions from being warm and funny to being one of the funniest things ever made. But this change is something I want to focus on because it does get overlooked by people. I'm going to go back to that round table with Conan again, where they note that probably the show's most enduring sequence of Homer jumping Springfield Gorge in Bart the Daredevil, Matt Groening was initially against it. It was always made very clear to me that, that this is a real world. I, I think it was Matt who was really against Homer falling down a cliff because 
rightfully, he didn't want his show to be perceived as a goofy cartoon. Right. This viewpoint actually makes total sense if you watch the show in order straight through seasons 1 and 2, and compare the more down-to-earth episodes like Life on the Fast Lane to the more bombastic ones like Marge vs. the Monorail. In season 1 we had ridiculous concepts like Homer and Bart go missing in the woods and end up being captured by scientists who are convinced that Homer is Bigfoot, but the Homer jumping Springfield Gorge sequence was where the show started to actively embrace the fact it was a cartoon. Although the difference between this and a lot of the overtly cartoonish stuff that came after it was of course that it was preceded by a heartfelt moment where Bart tells Homer he loves him. I won't jump anymore, I promise! Oh, oh thank god, thank god, thank god! I love you, Dad! I love you too, son. I'm not dunking on season 4 and March vs. the Monorail for the record. March vs. the Monorail is one of the funniest episodes of TV ever made and is easily one of my overall favourites. It's just clear that there was a divergence in interest between what people like Matt Groening wanted for the show and what the rest of the writers ended up wanting for the show, which is a fact that Conan himself admits. I remember I prided myself on, I'm going to write edgy jokes, I'm, I'm going to be a joke machine, and when I got there you guys explained this ethos The Simpson has, that this is a real family, and when I first heard that I thought, yeah, who cares about that? And, and, and subsequently, I've realized that is probably the secret to the show's longevity. The heartfelt moments were still there as the years wore on, though, and they do some episodes that are almost entirely dedicated to tugging at your heartstrings. Marge Be Not Proud from Season 7 is the obvious one, where Bart, desperate for the new video game Bone Storm, shoplifts it, gets caught, and then Marge finds out, and it ruins their relationship. And they go all in levels of heartbreak on it. It's a true sign to Marge that Bart is growing up and she views him in a completely different way now. Mm, he's not my little baby anymore. Maybe I mother him too much. Even though by this point in the series Bart has been accused of murder, this act of shoplifting is written to be so much more devastating. Some people don't like Marge Be Not Proud because it's so moody and depressing, but it's the payoff necessary to make the framework of the series function the way it has to. You have to feel this bad for Bart when he screws up like this, so you have that as the firm reminder that he is at least sincere, fresh in your mind, when you watch him rejoice in pain and misery. To be able to have episodes with wall-to-wall -wall gags like Marge vs. the Monorail, you need episodes like I Love Lisa, like Marge Be Not Proud, where you see these people for the flawed human beings that they are. Because The Simpsons isn't just a joke delivery vehicle. It sustained its success for so long because it's made you give a shit about these characters as people and how they function as part of their world. And speaking of that world, let's move on to the key source of comedy that the show is famous for. In a section I'm going to call, Everything in Springfield is either broken or rubbish. Matt Groening's earlier comic strip, Life in Hell, is key to his entire ethos as a comedy writer and producer, down to the very name, Life in Hell a comic strip about a bunch of anthropomorphic rabbits going through average daily stressful situations. Relationships, work, children, etc. That's supposed to be hell. And this worldview is written into a large chunk of the characters who mostly fall into certain archetypes. There's the comedically incompetent, like Chief Wiggum, Mayor Quimby, Lionel Hutz. The pious or professional adult that makes the other characters feel inadequate by comparison, like Ned Flanders or Dr. Hibber or my personal favourite archetype, the just too tired to give a shit. And that encompasses so many of them. Miss Hoover, Moe, and personal favourite, Reverend Lovejoy. Diddly diddly! Ned, have you thought about one of the other major religions? They're, they're all pretty much the same. Of course, having a view of the world that skews negative no matter the situation would seem depressing, which is why The Simpsons plays it almost like the environment is purposely constructed in such a broken and rubbish way as to inform the comedy. And it's taken to a point where it's so cynical that it becomes actively absurd. The point of the plotline in Round Springfield, where Bart gets sick by accidentally eating a free jagged metal Crusty-O in his cereal, wasn't that they're so lapsed in regulations in America that a company could actually genuinely get away with that. It's a macho exaggeration of the type of things that companies can get away with marketing to kids, and that Krusty has been in the entertainment industry for so long that he just doesn't give a shit what crappy product has his name on it. It's so extreme in its cynicism and so extreme in absurdity that it becomes funny. Krusty in particular is evocative of this cynical worldview that the show has. It's the fact he's Bart's childhood hero and he looks up to him that makes it increasingly hard to accept the fact that Krusty is basically a cold, uncaring monster behind that exterior. Bart saved him from prison, 
Krusty's thankful for a moment, but by season 3 he's blown off giving Bart a thank you dinner a billion times. And by season 5 he's completely forgotten he ever existed. What's your name? I'm Bart Simpson. I saved you from jail. Oh, I... I reunited you with your estranged father. Uh, well, what have you done for me lately? I got you that Danish. And I'll never forget it. This of course is part of the formula that's vital to keep the show going, where characters can't learn lessons and grow and change. These events did happen in this reality, it's not like Bart saving Krusty from jail and saving his career as stuff that we just forgot about, but the lessons that were learned by Krusty can't stick, because that breaks the formula. But this actually makes these events and this character even more tragic. Bart can list all the times he's helped Krusty out all he wants, but Krusty's unmoved by any of it. Because he can't be, because then the show stops working. Outside the context of a cartoon, if Krusty was a real person, that would be incredibly depressing, wouldn't it? There are people like Krusty in the entertainment industry, but here it's this extreme impression of the lack of care for the high regard that audience members like Bart hold him in that makes Krusty into a funny character. Mrs. Krabappel is similarly jaded and falls into the just too tired to give a shit archetype, but being a public school teacher she's much more relatable and easier to sympathise with given the backstory that she drops all the time. How come you don't live with Mr. Krabappel? Because Mr. Krabappel chased something small and fluffy down a rabbit hole. Although Edna is sarcastic and cynical, and has been broken by her marriage and the grind of public schools, and she does have the ingrained view of Bart as basically irredeemable, she does actually care about the kids. You're selling out these children's futures! Oh come on Edna, we both know these children have no future! <laughs> Prove me wrong kids! Prove me wrong! Similarly, the so incompetent I can't believe you actually have this job isn't always a strict definition either. Chief Wiggum is known for being incompetent, and you wouldn't think a character who says things like this oh, now dig up, stupid. would have managed to retain the role of Chief of Police for so long, but in Bart the Murderer, he is actually on to Fat Tony. Baloney! I'm not gonna rest until one of us is behind bars. You! Granted he doesn't speak out when a ten-year-old child gets accused of being the mastermind, but my point is that characters can break the mould sometimes, which is key to giving them more definition as real people that exist in this exaggerated cartoon impression of what it's like to live in a flawed real world. Of course real people wouldn't behave in the way they do on The Simpsons, but The Simpsons is relatable in the way that when you've been sat in a traffic jam, and you felt the blood vessel pounding in your forehead, and for a second you make yourself laugh when you daydream that maybe the traffic jam's being caused by a local traffic reporter's helicopter that crashed on the road, and he's holding up the very traffic that he's reporting on. Looks like we got a little accident that's backing traffic up as far as this reporter can see! <laughs> The show treads this fine line between being real and not real at the same time, as seemingly contradictory as that sounds. It's almost like a lot of the townsfolk are aspects of a character in itself. Springfield, a small average crappy town in America where people seemingly only exist for the singular goal in life of pissing you off. And these characters will often start life in service of either a specific plotline, as is the case with Dr. Nick in Bart Gets Hit by a Car, where the family needs a doctor who's less honest than Dr. Hibbert, or sometimes just for the sake of one joke, as is the case with Cletus. Well, you'd be grumpy too if you were taken out of your natural habitat and gawked at by a bunch of slack-jawed yokels. Hey, Ma, look at that pointy-haired little girl. These characters are all there to make the world worse in some way. Probably the best character that does this is Lionel Hutz, who, like Krusty, is an exaggerated impression of what people perceive lawyers to be like. He uses purposefully vague language so he can draw you in, before revealing that, no, it wasn't my fault that you believed what I wanted you to believe. But your ad says no money down. Oh, they got this all screwed up. So you don't work on a contingency basis? No, money down! A lot of people put Phil Hartman's untimely death and the subsequent retirement of Hutz and Troy McClure as the end of the Golden Age, and I do see why. I treasure every syllable of dialogue that Lionel Hutz has. He's just gold dust in character form. Mr. Hutz, why are you burning all your personal papers? As of this moment, Lionel Hutz no longer exists. Say hello to Miguel Sanchez! This middle period of the Golden Years, where it goes so over-the-top absurd, is where this tactic to engineer storylines out of the world just naturally being shitty really shines. 
and the wilder and more exaggerated nature of this period of the show had a beneficial effect on the series longest running experiment with the format. As I mentioned earlier, the fantasy sequences where we see what a character's thinking are almost like mini Treehouse of Horror episodes, where the already loose relationship the show has with reality gets loosened even further. The initial premise of the first one is utterly genius in its simplicity. It's Halloween, Bart and Lisa are sat around in the treehouse telling each other spooky stories, which turn into fully fleshed out fantasy sequences. It's a great springboard for rearranging the familiar elements of The Simpsons into an odder and more obtuse shape than usual. Although the framing device of the characters telling each other three stories gets ditched in the following years, presumably because everyone knows what they're about by now, so we might as well just start. The Treehouse episodes also get noticeably more unsettling by the fourth one, and I think the reason for that is down to the mentioned change in the degree of cartoon hyperreality. Because viewing these episodes in context of the series they were a part of, you do notice that the Treehouse of Horror reality isn't actually that different from the main reality of the show. Characters are always saying strange and out there stuff that no human being would actually say and do, even in normal episodes. Cape Fear is a prime example of this. It's basically a full length Treehouse of Horror. Say your prayers, Simpson. <laughs> Because the schools can't force you like they should. Ma, these new finger razors make heads trimming as much fun as sitting through church. Cape Fear warps the Simpsons' reality as a way of toying with Bart's emotional state, and it kind of feels aware of the fact it is a story. In the same way the Treehouse of Horror episodes are designed to be artificial. They tell you that this is a story that they're telling. And the sci-fi or supernatural elements aren't totally limited to the Treehouse of Horror episodes either. Does anyone remember that an alien shows up in the Stonecutter song for the sake of a 5 second gag? Same thing happens in Sideshow Bob's Last Gleaming. Robots rise up against humanity in Last Exit to Springfield. Crush, kill, destroy. Usually this stuff is just there for the purpose of a simple gag, but my point is that these sci-fi or supernatural elements are there in the main reality. Aliens do exist in the Simpsons universe. And yet, in the Treehouse episodes, the hyper-reality that The Simpsons already existed within becomes unsettling, because when you take every rule of the show away and say that anything can happen, our main characters can die now and there will be no consequences for any of it, the sense that anything can happen becomes threatening. Typically in a Simpsons episode, anything can happen, but in Treehouse of Horror, really, anything can happen. Ned Flanders can be decapitated, Homer can have Mr Burns' head grafted onto his shoulder, I'm going to take my favourite segment as an example, the Treehouse 5 story, Nightmare Cafeteria. What I love so much about Nightmare Cafeteria is that it's so utterly deranged, sickening and morbid, and yet unlike most Treehouse segments, there's no supernatural or sci-fi element to it. Although Treehouse of Horror is supposed to have no boundaries in storytelling, usually they do still fall into expected Simpsons takes on typical horror tropes, or a specific movie parody. Of course there's zombies, vampires and ghosts, but most Treehouse segments usually have something recognisably supernatural about them. What makes Nightmare Cafeteria stand out is that there's no ancient curse, there's nothing that's making anyone act insane. Nightmare Cafeteria just proposes the idea, what if these overworked public school teachers, these characters that we've known and loved for years, what if one day they just fucking snap and start carving up the children and feeding them to each other? And that's it. That's the plot. You might even say we just ate Uder and he's in our stomachs right now. <laughs> they don't even alter Skinner's appearance or change any other aspects of his character at all. It just takes Skinner and makes him into an unrepentant cannibal. It's the fact it treats its plot so casually that makes it stand out. The school's under budget, Lunch Lady Doris is struggling to feed the children, the detention room is overcrowded, and Principal Skinner arrives at what he sees as a perfectly logical solution to all of these problems. And even when people find out what he did, no one reacts. A at all. <gasps> Are you saying you killed Jimbo, processed his carcass and served him for lunch? <laughs> this is supposed to be the joke of course, and it is funny, but it's simultaneously the reason why I always found Nightmare Cafeteria particularly chilling. 
The source of the horror is exactly the same as the source of the comedy. If no one thinks that this is a problem, no one's going to come to the kid's rescue. Of course, the obvious question in a scenario like this would be, what if the parents find out what the teachers are doing? Obviously, people's kids are going to go missing. But they even seal up what might be a stretch of your disbelief in the most chilling, but also hilarious way possible by having the kids ask Marge for help. Marge typically being one of the more level-headed adults in Springfield. You march right back to that school, look them straight in the eye and say, don't eat me. Okay. This story is so terrifying because it's stuck Bart and Lisa in a situation where they can't trust any of the adults around them. Nightmare Cafeteria really spoke to me when I was a kid because I didn't trust people either. Of course, I didn't think the adults in my life were legitimately going to kill and eat me, but like all the impressionistic life is shit to the extreme jokes I talked about, it's the vague paranoid feeling that gets captured so well in Nightmare Cafeteria. It's like my neurotic teenage stress dreams brought to life. Main reason I bring this one up in particular is that I want to make the point that in the Treehouse canon, we're much more likely to accept than doing extreme things with the characters, like making Skinner a cannibal. Because yes, this is going to be very important when we talk about that one. In this wilder and looser version of the show, we can change things. We can give Bart a secret evil twin brother, and leave the situation as if this is an apparent change to the status quo. Hugo is now the older brother, and Bart is the one that lives in the attic, and that's the end of that. Mom, here goes eating his napkin. <laughs> hey, can I have some turkey? Oh, you finish your fish heads, then we'll talk. But what I want to get at is that apparent extreme change does happen in the main show as well. I first noticed this way back in Bart Gets an F in season 2. By the end of the episode, Martin's been corrupted by Bart's destructive ways and been completely inverted as a character. Later, Mrs. K. The show isn't averse to changing the characters outside of the Treehouse of Horror and experimenting by testing their reality. It's just that it gets reset and never mentioned again. Including when it kills characters in some instances. Hans Molman has either been killed or seriously injured multiple times with no resolution. Wait, it's that delightful TV leprechaun. I'm going to get your lucky charms. Oh no, my brains. All of this is related to a point I made in a video earlier this year, where I argued in favour of making the show's main reality more like the Treehouse of Horror universe for the sake of capturing people's attention in our new clickbait-driven environment of streaming media. Because the Treehouse segments were always so memorable to people purely because they tested the boundaries, or pushed certain characters further in the extremes of their character. Sure, some of them are movie or Twilight Zone parodies that are going to stick out to you based on being something you're a fan of already, like the Nightmare on Elm Street one, the Shining one, or the monster on the side of the bus. But the stuff that sticks out to me are the ones that do things like make Flanders the devil, or when they make Flanders the unquestioned lord and master of the world. Now, in case all that smiling didn't cheer you up, there's one thing that never fails. Nice glass of warm milk, a little nap, and a total frontal lobotomy. Yeah, actually thinking about it, most of my favourite Treehouse episodes are based on what they do with Flanders. Point being, the fact the Treehouse episodes are so wild and so experimental is what makes them memorable. And the main reality of the show could take some more cues from that. It's not the only place where they experiment with form, of course. Another example is 22 short films about Springfield, which wraps around all the characters showing us tiny fragments of their days. And is what inevitably leads us on to this discussion. So, Superintendent Chalmers comes to Skinner's house. Skinner's dinner is ruined. Chalmers sees steam. Skinner tries to hide it by saying they're having steamed clams. Skinner then goes out the window to Krusty Burger and brings back hamburgers. Chalmers says he thought they were having steamed clams. Skinner says, no, I said steamed hams. Being on YouTube in the first place, you will inevitably be aware of the fact that of all the Simpsons bits, this is the one that's become the gargantuan hit online, which did kind of confuse me at first. Like, yes I agree it's a masterpiece, but of all the jokes and segments they did, why is this the one that sticks out? Its brevity might have something to do with its appeal. It's a self-contained sketch with the most universally appealing function out of all the bits from 22 short films about Springfield. It's a simple farce. It's somehow so memorable, and yet so easy to replace the specific elements in it, that Steam Tams is actually ripe for the meme remixes that everyone spent the best part of a decade sharing and resharing on YouTube. Every time you think someone's run out of ideas of something to do with it, another one comes along. Steam Tams, but it's All-Star by Smash Mouth. Steam Tams, but it's Pulp Fiction. 
Steamed hams, but it's Australian. Okay, you've run out by now, surely. Wait, steamed hams, but it's a German expressionist film. Uh, okay, that's it, that one wins. There's something about internet culture around this skit that's truly managed to express how The Simpsons Golden Age kind of belongs to everyone now. The big Simpsons memes kind of exist in this strange space where these images have become embossed on our collective memories. That clip of Homer backing into a hedge has become so enduring and iconic that it's written onto the inside of your brain in such fine detail that I don't even need to show it to you. If I just show you this splodge of yellow, this splodge of green, and the word Homer, your brain will combine this stimuli and immediately think of Homer backing into a hedge, even though I didn't copy and paste that clip into my timeline. I'm probably not the only person who thinks entirely in Simpsons references. Whenever anyone says a random word that my brain can connect up with a Simpsons joke, it will do it. A celebrity's been accused of a crime? How many S's in innocent? Everyone's having some tedious internet argument about veganism or something? If a cow ever got the chance, he'd eat you and everyone you care about. And the collective cultural impact of this period of the show and how enduring these images are led to an understandable backlash against the Golden Age's least popular episodes. The only episodes of the Golden Age that score below average for this period on IMDb are the clip shows, often cited among the show's worst. Even among the episodes that piss people off from the later years, these are still held up as particularly rubbish. The argument always went that the clip shows were unnecessary because the golden years were rerun so often, everyone remembered every tiny detail of every episode, and so a clip show thrown together to fill the Simpsons block during the new season essentially became obsolete the second that it aired, especially when the show went to home release and then streaming. They ended up having no value because if I wanted to watch Life on the Fast Lane again, I'd just watch Life on the Fast Lane again. I wouldn't watch a Cliff Notes version of it in another Simpsons clip show. However, I would like to point out that the clip shows are essentially a 90s version of YouTube Funniest Simpsons Moments compilation reels, and I watch those all the time. It's not as if the market for Simpsons clips in easily digestible forms is nothing, and I'm forever looking up short clips of bits that I remember from episodes. Sometimes I don't want to sit and watch the whole of Krusty Gets Cancelled, I just want to see the Worker and Parasite bit when I'm sat on the toilet putting off going back to my desk for another few minutes. I should also say that at least the clip shows have something original to offer, at least there's a framework. You can see them dragging their feet with this too, with that title, So It's Come To This. And there is at least sarcasm and meta humour in the framework as they recontextualise these clips. And there's one itchy and scratchy cartoon I don't think we'll ever forget. Ah! Why'd you bring that up? It was an amazing episode. Of our lives. The strongest clip show is easily the 138th show Spectacular, where they make it a cheesy variety show hosted by Troy McClure, with deleted scenes and alternate endings to Who Shot Mr. Burns. This does at least add value for the viewers, and it's probably why this is the clip show that gets the least amount of hate. By making it purposefully unnatural, it ends up feeling more natural than the family sitting around saying things like, hey, remember that time that Homer almost cheated on Marge? The clip shows aren't great, but it's not as if they don't add anything of value to the show. So it's time for that question, when does the golden age end? There are many, many answers. It's particularly hard to say because if the show has always been there, you don't notice how it changes. It's like how you never notice if your partner or your children change in appearance because you see them every day. No, Stuart, your hairline isn't receding. I haven't noticed. Ha ha, going bald. It could be argued that the Golden Age ended when the show started embracing its cartoon hyperreality, and with that change it became less a show about a real family that just happens to be a cartoon, and more a cartoon that just happens to be about a real family. But if that's how you define the Golden Age, then it ends about Season 3, and Seasons 4 and 5 are some of the strongest Simpsons episodes in the show's run. It could potentially be argued that it ends with The Star Is Burns, the infamous crossover with the John Lovitz cartoon The Critic, that offended Matt Groening so greatly that he insisted his name be taken off the show. 
I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with A Star Is Burns. It gave us Are You Saying Boo or Boo Earns and That's The Joke. And it has some of my favourite non-meme jokes in it as well. My name is Barney and I'm an alcoholic. Mr. Gumble, this is a Girl Scout meeting. Is it? Or is it that you girls can't admit you have a problem? But I do see why Groening took issue with it. While yes, The Simpsons is a cartoon about yellow people where anything can happen, and it makes meta jokes all the time that play about with the cartoon format, the show's initial ethos was that it was about a real family. That's why Groening called the town Springfield. He's explained in interviews that when he was growing up, watching the show Father Knows Best, he noted that it was set in Springfield, and he imagined that the show was set in the town next to his hometown, Portland, which was called Springfield, and that really captured his imagination. Then when he grew up, he realised that Springfield is one of the most common city names in the US, and so he called the town Springfield, and we never know which state it's in, so that anyone watching it can imagine it's their Springfield. The connection to the real world was incredibly important to Groening, and by doing a crossover episode with another cartoon, you kind of shatter that real world connection, and basically make The Simpsons like any other cartoon. Of course, you in the present day don't understand this point of view at all based on almost everything The Simpsons has done since then. But in the context of 1995, I kind of, kind of, see why Groening felt that crossing over with the critic was crossing a sacred line for him. Even though when I watched it, I had no idea it was a crossover, and neither did quite a lot of people, because The Simpsons is just way more famous than The Critic ever was. Personally, I think the answer to the question of when does the Golden Age end is whenever you personally think it ends. I'm not necessarily agreeing with the conventional understanding of the Golden Age. The point of this project is to measure qualitative differences between the periods conventionally referred to as Good Simpsons and Bad Simpsons. So for this video I've just gone with the most common definition and I'm going to compare it to the next period in the next one. I also think it's kind of weird that people exclude Season 9 from the Golden Age just because the second episode of it is the infamous Jumps the Shark moment. Season 9's great! They took on Scientology way before South Park did. Lisa Sachs is just as strong a flashback episode as any of the previous ones. Then it's still got Lionel Hutz in it. Seasons 4, 6 and 7 all have a clip show in them that people don't like. Season 9 has the worst clip show and The Principal and the Pauper, but aside from that, come on, it's two episodes. Anyway, since I just mentioned Principal and the Pauper, let's talk about the episode that everyone is convinced ends the Golden Age. There is a very good reason why I personally don't think The Principal and the Pauper is this catastrophic mismanagement of the character of Seymour Skinner that everyone says it is. So, in case you've never seen this one, we reveal that Skinner was an imposter the entire time. He's actually Armin Tamzarian, and he took the real Seymour Skinner's name and life when Sergeant Seymour Skinner went missing and was presumed dead in Vietnam. Those who recall my fight to outlaw teenage rudeness may be shocked to learn that I myself was once a street punk. A common opinion I've seen is that showing Skinner as a street punk ruins him because Skinner was portrayed for the entire series as a buttoned-down boring man with boring interests. And people can't square the idea that someone, well, square, could ever have been this completely different character. I'm gonna have to begin my debunking of this with an anecdote. And I understand that anecdotes are not data, but this is why personally for me this works. Almost too well. Back when I was in school and me and my friends were watching The Golden Age for the first time, we had a deputy head teacher who, like Skinner, was a boring man who wore boring suits, and you couldn't imagine him ever having an interesting backstory. Clearly this was a man born into his suit, and he was interested in maths and ancient history from a young age. But there was always this rumour going around that in his youth he was a football hooligan with long hair, and the story went that a picture of him ended up in a foreign newspaper. Surely not, everyone thought. Really, him. Yeah, apparently he showed the other teachers the newspaper. Loads of them backed this up, they said it was all true. And so it was kind of hilarious to me and my friends when BBC Two aired a repeat of The Principal and the Pauper, which basically told that exact story. It's about how you think you have the measure of someone, but they've actually led this wild and interesting backstory off screen. 
Furthermore, this idea that Skinner was always a button-down man to whom the idea of being interesting was anathema to him was never quite true. We always knew that he was a veteran of Vietnam, and there are occasional moments where he reveals a darker edge to him. You got an ex-Green Beret mad. <laughs> Forgot about me in that tiger cage for 18 agonizing months. Every night I wake up screaming. To me, the message I always got from Seymour Skinner was that he lived an extremely eventful life and was traumatized by it, and now he wants something simple. Bart is 10 and craves what he sees as fun and excitement, which he thinks are chaos and destruction. Whereas Skinner has witnessed chaos and destruction firsthand and knows what it's like, and so now his definition of excitement is things like this. Now class, I wonder who among you can tell me what this is. And yet of course he's a mama's boy. When you experience extreme stress and trauma, you'll go completely to pieces and want your parents to sort everything out for you. I guess I couldn't bear to tell her about her son. What I did was wrong, but I'd do it again. Yes, mother, it's me! So... I, I don't know, yes, it's completely ridiculous, but something about this moment where Tamzarian makes this decision to take on the guise of the presumably deceased Sergeant Seymour Skinner just makes me nod my head and go... Okay, yeah, this is the most insane thing that I've ever heard, but yeah, you've given it the sincerity it needs in order to work. Because sincerity is the key to making The Simpsons work, even in ridiculous circumstances. And I also find it incredibly interesting that I saw this episode fairly early on in my life as a Simpsons fan. I watched it before Bart the Murderer and Bart Gets Famous, and when I ended up watching those episodes, the knowledge of his true identity as Armin Tanzarian didn't really change the way I viewed Skinner. I wasn't thinking about him as a secret street punk as I was watching him show genuine enthusiasm about boxes and unsealed envelopes. Because Simpson stories are always self-contained to some degree. You can compartmentalise interesting Skinner and boring Skinner. In the same way you can look back at something stupid you did when you were younger and go, oh god, I can't believe I was like that when I was 18. I mean, by this point in the show, in the Trias of Horror universe, we'd seen him become a sadistic cannibal for literally no reason at all. I believe I'll start as you'd so often suggested by eating your shorts. Oh. Granted that's Treehouse canon, but this is why I spent that section making the point that the Treehouse universe isn't really that different to the main show. The main show does contain its own canon messing in extreme violence. Martin changed his character and went back to normal. Homer and Ned made friends and the show just left it at that, but then things went back to normal afterwards. Maybe if they hadn't drawn attention to it the way they did, they'd have gotten away with it. But that's part of why I found it so funny. It's just for a week. Principal and the Pauper almost plays like a satirization of how The Simpsons exists in this bubble universe where almost nothing is allowed to change. Selma got a pet lizard and Lisa went vegetarian, and people make references to stuff that happened in previous episodes like Bart saving Krusty's career, but because this is a TV format designed for continuous production, everything needs to go back to how it was. But in The Principal and the Pauper, they don't just ignore it like before. Here they actually set in stone that things will reset, in the most contrived way possible, as a self-aware comment on just how contrived this entire storyline was. I hereby confer upon you the name of Seymour Skinner, as well as his past, present, future, and mother. And I further decree that everything will be just like it was before all this happened, and no one will ever mention it again. Granted, my personal acceptance of Armin Tamzarian is a very personal viewpoint based on my own history, and maybe this sort of thing will end up getting tested as I move through the next period of the show, but I still don't think Principal and the Pauper is nearly as much of an error as people make it out to be. So yeah, in conclusion, the things I'm going to keep in mind going into the rest of it mostly concern how the wholly sincere episodes like Marge Be Not Proud, or sincere moments in episodes like Homer's Triple Bypass, are there to balance out the wholly jokey ones like Marge vs the Monorail. Although the fabric of the show is absurd, it's the earnest moments and the sincerity that it established in those first three years that have carried the show and made these characters so memorable. This is why I'm always going to disagree with people when they say seasons 1 and 2, some people say as far as 3 don't count as the golden age. But those very early days provided the foundation for what made the connection that people have with this family function. Seasons 4, 5 and 6 may have the best jokes, but the show didn't sustain itself for all that time on simply being the funniest show on television. 
It's the mix of high-intensity emotional drama and razor-sharp deadpan sarcasm that made the show the phenomenon that it was. Anyway, before I finish up, if you put a gun to my head and made me arrange any of this period into a top 10, this is my list. And since I just talked about most of these at great length, we're going to go through these quick capsule style. Number 10, Separate Vocations. This one is the perfect execution of the classic sitcom role swap storyline, where two characters' traits are switched for what are usually arbitrary reasons. But in this case it improves on the old formula because it's for psycho and sociological reasons. By a career aptitude test assigning Bart and Lisa unexpected career paths, they both trust the adults around them saying that this is what will happen to them in the future. Despite the fact the reasoning the adults offer for this is basically non-existent, they just had some test results fed into a machine. The reactions Bart and Lisa have to this news is very real and very human. That and this episode contains one of the Golden Age's best jokes. Well, that was a waste of time. Jamie, school is never a waste of time. Since we have 15 minutes until recess, please put down your pencils and stare at the front of the room. Number 9, Bart the Murderer. Like I said, Bart's not interesting because he's a psychopathic little bastard who can get away with anything. He's interesting because he wants to get away with everything, but is overly conscientious when things get out of control and go too far. The apparent murder of Principal Skinner isn't Bart's fault, but he feels that it is, and that manifests in a ridiculous scenario where the entire town believes that he's guilty. Number 8. Fear of Flying Huh, I didn't mention one of my all-time favourites in this whole thing. Yeah, Fear of Flying's glorious. Kavner captures Marge so beautifully in this episode in particular, and the story they've given her to work with is on par with Moaning Lisa when it comes to The Simpsons getting mental health so perfectly right, and importantly, advocating therapy. Homer is against therapy, an opinion many people take. The quiet part that they won't usually say out loud is that they're against it because they see someone in their life going through therapy as a personal attack on them. But Marge doesn't want therapy to be about Homer, and even when her therapist prods her towards it, she makes it clear that she wants to deal with her fear of flying. She's presented with a tool for mental health, therapy, and uses it to meet her needs. That's what therapy's for. That and the jokes are just so on point and don't undermine the subject matter in a way that you would expect of an episode about such a serious subject. No, I don't need therapy, I'm fine, and it's too expensive. And I don't believe in it. It turns wives against husbands. Children against fathers! Neighbours against me! Number 7, Treehouse of Horror 5. I already gushed about Nightmare Cafeteria, so I'll just add that the other two segments are some of Treehouse of Horror's strongest as well. The time-travelling toaster one is hilariously stupid, easily one of the maddest Simpsons bits, where it rearranges the familiar elements of the Simpsons universe into such strange forms. And of course, The Shining one is one of the best examples of parody that clearly cherishes its source material. Hmm, that's odd. Usually the blood gets off at the second floor. Number 6, Cape Fear. I know I've only put this at number 6, but I don't think I've ever laughed as hard at an episode of The Simpsons as much as I did the first time I watched Cape Fear. Like Sideshow Bob in this episode, the jokes just sort of leap at you out of nowhere, and you never see them coming. Surely there's no harm in laying in the middle of a public street. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> number 5, I'm going to cheat here and put it at a three-way tie between the flashback episodes from seasons 3, 4, and 6. I Married Marge, Lisa's First Word, and Maggie Makes Three, showing where the family was at around the time of the births of Bart, Lisa, and Maggie. Lisa's First Word is easily the funniest, but they all have incredibly strong emotional moments, and serve as the perfect origin story for the family. And it's just incredibly interesting to see the three Simpsons kids at different stages of life than what we're used to. Number 4, Homer's Triple Bypass. One Fish, Two Fish, Blowfish, Bluefish was easily the strongest episode of Season 2, and Homer's Triple Bypass is essentially a repeat of Homer is in a life-threatening, health-related situation, but with the humour refined to its sharpest point. It's got the emotional core of early Simpsons blended with the god-tier absurdist humour of Season 4. And speaking of Season 4... Number 3, Marge vs the Monorail. I feel bad that most of what I've said in this video about Marge vs the Monorail has been to its detriment, about how it was a sign of a shift in The Simpsons' focus, so now I have to reinforce and hammer the fact that it is one of my overall favourites. Every 10 seconds you see one of the show's most famous jokes, and it's one of those episodes of TV where it's still just as funny the 99th time I've seen it as the first time. Hello, my name is Mr. Snrub, and I come from, uh, 
Some place far away. Number two, Round Springfield. I only just got that that title is a reference to the Bleeding Gums Murphy album and the jagged metal crustio that Bart swallows. It's got a hilarious plot with Bart and an emotionally touching plot with Lisa that meet at the end with emotional resonance for both their characters. This episode is very much the perfect circle of The Simpsons and doesn't get nearly enough love. Number one. Yeah, given this is the early years, this will be the best episode of The Simpsons ever, according to me, won't it? Huh, am I doing this? Am I really doing this? Yeah, it's life on the fast lane. It's about a million miles away from the funniest Simpsons episode, but it cemented the Simpsons' approach to character, and as said, that has been the key factor that's made the show last for so long. You can see the influence that early Simpsons has had on modern animated shows that have gone for hyper-realistic emotions like Bojack Horseman. The idea that a cartoon can make you feel such a deep well of emotions was demonstrated here with such sophistication that I can't not say Life on the Fast Lane is the best episode. On a pure technical level, the construction of Marge's character arc is pure genius, and the jokes tread a fine line between being funny and heartbreaking. There's lots of stuff like Life on the Fast Lane, but few episodes of any animated show you care to name come close to matching it in pure emotional power. Dad, you didn't even say ouch. Oh, sorry. Ouch. Look, Dad, I don't know what's going on, but once you gave me some advice that might help, you told me when something's bothering you and you're too damn stupid to know what to do, just keep your full mouth shut. Good advice. Thanks for watching everyone. If you'd like to see regular updates about videos I'm working on, see videos in progress while I'm working on them, or just other odds and ends that I don't post publicly, you can subscribe to my Patreon. I'd like to thank the following generous people. A. Maxwell, Alastair McPherson, Aniron Hunt, Captain Grezza, Chris Lim, Chris P, Dave Sanders, Dio Halo, Jennifer Milligan, Joel, Louise Wade, Matthew Brench, Max Kennedy, Oxbow is Amsty, Pastel Witch, Robert Comley, and The Hickster. Cheers everybody, see you next time.